Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I miss a good though. Hello, hello. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, Okay. All right. Okay. Shoot. Well, first question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your opinion? What does it take to train the young? What does it take to train the young? Well, we don't have to have you guys you start out. You start out some. Yeah. <laughs> Patience and some strong nerves. <laughs> <laughs> Patience. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, young people <laughs> learn by example. So you have to set the example for them. That's my feeling. You know, if, if you're calm and thoughtful and think things through, I think mm -hmm. they will develop those kind of habits. Most people get in trouble when they shoot from the hip and open their mouth before their brain gets engaged. Mm -hmm. So you always have to teach them that they're basically in control of whatever the situation is in most instances. And as long as they maintain that control, they can pretty much determine what happens. So I guess it's how you act before them is the first lesson that they learn. And I always told mine that they could do anything anyone else can do. You know, I always ran my life that way. Mm -hmm. when, I went, when I went in the Army, it was about zero down at Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And we were out there in our street clothes. And the guy said, I know you aren't dressed for this kind of weather. And I know you cold but you're going to stay out here anyway. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the guy next to me and I said, well, if you make it, I'll make it. And that's the way I made it. Whatever the situation was, the other guy make it, I can make it too. Mm -hmm. So, it didn't bother me. We were all going to be in trouble together. <laughs> <laughs> and our youngest son was, um, always said to his dad, Dad, Said, I have never heard just one word I've never heard you use and he said what what is that Fred he said I can't so you mm. never say I that's can't that's not in your vocabulary no that's what he no. he tell, he would well, tell I believe I can do anything anybody else can do may not do it as well I'll do some things better and some not as well but I can do what anybody else can do I don't believe anybody can do anything that I can't do okay. Yeah, you know, I think you have, if you don't have confidence in yourself, who else is going to have confidence in you? Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't be cocky, but you can be confident. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference. Yeah. People get it confused at times, yep. but there's a big You're difference. You're right. You're right. <laughs> yeah. How did you learn that kind of confidence? Did your parents really encourage you like that? Oh, I think, you know, my mother did. Or, you know, my father passed away when I was three years mm -hmm. old, so I, mm -hmm. I grew up without it without a father and I had two brothers and my youngest brother came down with polio when he was one mm -hmm. and so my mother had three boys to raise and we ended up on the welfare rolls so I grew up on welfare so mm -hmm. I know what it is not have anything have warm clothes food and stuff but it didn't destroy me it probably made me stronger yeah. mm -hmm. definitely make you want more no, I never have been a person that wanted a mm -hmm. lot of material mm -hmm. things, you know. Uh, I think there are a lot of more things, a lot more important than having material things. You know, mm -hmm. you have the things that are necessary to live. And all that material junk never did bother me. You know, I, I don't worry about having a new car every year, a new suit, and all that kind of stuff. You know, I had what I needed, and that was adequate for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that kind of vanity, I guess, mm -hmm. that people have that need those kind of things to make them feel good. I never did need that. So you had three, two, two brothers, so just three boys, mm -hmm. and then what did you have? Now? What else? I had, we had five girls and one boy. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my, my mother and father died. My one died in June. And the other one died in September. Yeah. September. Mm -hmm. And we were all babies. 
the hood. Be like a baby, she was little. Be a little woman, what? We were little. That was 1940 when your mother or your father died. I saw him, he was born in 1929. I'm telling them how old you are. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I'm just saying, she didn't have to go. She said, baby. Oh, it depends. Uh, baby, well, well, like we little were. guys just crawling around, you know. Oh, no, we weren't but, infants, but mm-hmm. we were six. six. It was six kids, mm-hmm. six little kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the only way we met. She came here for a summer with Aunt Knuckle that lived here, she and her sister, and she stayed. She found me and stayed. <laughs> <laughs> that's what really happened. That's what really happened. <laughs> that's what he yeah. says now. Right? Yeah, so... But her sister went back. She's from Montgomery, Alabama. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot from her. I learned a lot of things that I did not learn in school here in Muncie, Indiana. You know, I didn't know anything about Emancipation Day mm-hmm. or the Black National Anthem or anything. I never was told mm-hmm. anything like that. Mm-hmm. But she was when she went to school in, in Montgomery. So there's a lot that I learned from her that wasn't taught to me here in these school systems. Mm-hmm. There was a, um, we were reading up on, I don't know if it was either yours. You know what, I had something before you said, ask, ask a question, that's why I brought this out. Anyway, okay. I'm just thinking and talking at the same time. Um, there was a, we were in the archives the very first time we went in there, and I'd seen where it was talking about, um, the, um, classes that, well, core classes back in high school, like there was a, um, minority literature or some type of history in the, um, literature in the um, like more mixed schools rather than in black schools. We've been talking to a lot of different people and they're saying that they got more like of course black history in the black schools rather than in the white schools. Was that the same with Muncie Central? Because you said that you didn't really know too much about the black national anthem or anything like that. Where did you? I I wasn't taught that. You know most of that I learned after I was grown. So there wasn't any classes? I read something, something there was a mm-hmm. literature. That wasn't until like 1972. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, well then there we go. That's way after my yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. why I was asking Julius Anderson about that, but he didn't really remember that at all. Mm-hmm. Unless when he would have been in high school. Okay. Yeah, I didn't remember no, I didn't. much of anything about black history when I was coming through school. Uh, it just wasn't, wasn't emphasized, it wasn't mm-hmm. on the radar screen. Yeah at that time and you know we've really not been made aware it wasn't until the civil rights movement evolved that I really became you know knowledgeable and studied it and read about black inventors and other people that did a lot of things mm. you know uh, when they started more singing that when they started singing that well see I could just sing all ver- all of the verses mm-hmm. You know, and mm-hmm. without a book or anything, and so I said, "You learn that? Where could you learn all that?" Mm-hmm. I said, "You learned it at school. You have to. You learn that in the kindergarten. Really? Mm-hmm. Uh, you just grow up with that." You know, I think I learned that song when I was fourteen. We were, I was in a pageant, uh-huh. and we were doing a scene, and we had to do the national anthem. When I was fourteen, when I first was aware of we even having mm-hmm. a national anthem, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I was like, the black and I felt like, what is this? And then we got to read, and I was like, I've heard bits and pieces mm-hmm. from, you know, just mm-hmm. in church, people, mm-hmm. you know, huh? but you know, I don't know what it is, so I just kind of shove it off my shoulders, but that's the first person I had to learn it. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. it's like, we started to use a lot more, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. I didn't know about it until mom was looking to. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Man. Yeah, we sang that at yeah, church. It's, it's something that, you know, kids in northern schools don't get unless maybe they're in a inner city of Indianapolis or mm-hmm. Chicago or Detroit mm-hmm. or like that where they had a lot of black teachers and principals and all. I'm sure that they brought some of that with them because a lot of them came out of black colleges mm-hmm. and so they were exposed to that mm-hmm. culture. Mm-hmm. We're here, uh, we were not. What was your, um, we was, was in archives earlier today and I have uh, copied this. Um, you had, there was a meeting on the Education Task Force, and you were talking about the different things that you wanted to discuss. I wanted mm-hmm. to question. 1967. <laughs> I was going to say, my <laughs> Now that's your signature, right? That's yeah, your... that's my signature. 
These people yeah. that attended, are any of them still mm, Oh, hell, around? Wanda Thompson's still alive. Joe mm -hmm. Lyons is dead. Bernie Settle's dead. Thomas Williams, I don't know that. Alan Geringer's still alive. He's a principal at the elementary school here. He's white. Lavonna Dunworth, she was with somebody at the university. I don't think they're still around here. James Ellis, Lois Cher, Robert Miller. Miller is an attorney. He's still around. I assume that Dwayne Dietrich. I don't recognize that name. Boy, the looks of this list, there's only about three or four people on this that's still alive or still around here. And I wanted to call them and um, to kind of talk to them. You said mm -hmm. Thompson? Yeah. Um, Dunsworth? Uh, Lavana Dunsworth? No, she's not here. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Miller. He's going to turn that number 11 Lots down there. And uh, Alan Gehring. Mm -hmm. He's a pretty prolific writer now. A lot of his children's books and things. I thought it very interesting when I read it um, about things you wanted to discuss in this meeting. Did um, From looking at um, how you wanted things to change in the Muncie schools then, do you feel that they have changed now? I mean, you know, oh, yeah, of we, we had a, we had a real it. impact, you know, on the schools. And after this, I became a member of the Board of Education. And there were a lot of changes made during that eight years I was on, on the school board, including a dramatic increase in the number of black teachers hired in the system. At one time, we had over 40 black teachers mm -hmm. in the Muncie school system. I don't think it's... I know it's not anywhere close to that now, but I guess it's less than 20 this time. And that's all the school system still put together? That's my guess. You know, I can't, I, I really haven't counted them lately, but I know we've lost a lot because a lot of those that were hired during the time that I was on the board have retired. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, that's, we have a meeting once a year now with all former school board members, and they keep us posted on what they're doing and ask us if we have any concerns and all. And a concern that I expressed is that we had lost a man and his wife. It was uh, Homer Jackson and his wife, and they were both principals of two different elementary schools here, and they both retired two or three years ago. And we probably only had three principals, mm -hmm. black principals, and two of them left together and then Mr. Gorn who is administrate uh, assistant principal at Southside mm -hmm. High School and he was going to retire this year and the school system prevailed on him to stay but they still they aren't grooming anybody to take his place mm -hmm. you know and when he goes and the history of that school you know with its racial background history mm -hmm. and all with the rebels and the confederate flag and all that you know to and with probably now probably 15 or 20 percent black student body because the numbers have shrunk but i think the number of black students have may remain pretty stable mm -hmm. uh you know to to have that school out there with no black administrator is almost you know it's, it's criminal it's asking for trouble because what happens in a situation like that it's usually the black kids were, were against the white kids were but if there's a black adult there, a lot of things that would happen don't happen anyway because that adult is there. But the importance of that black adult is that the parents and the other people in the community will take his word for it if, you know, as to what happened. Mm -hmm. But they won't take white people's word for it because the history is that whites will not tell on each other. That they'll just remain silent or they'll say, I didn't see anything or I didn't hear anything and all of that and you need that credibility there so you say mr gorn who's telling the truth you know this happened and whatever he says the black community will accept that and you almost have to have that mm -hmm. that doesn't mean the black kids are right all the time but i'm just saying you have to have someone there that those parents have confidence in that the best interest of their child is important mm -hmm. to them because our experience has been a lot of majority people they really don't care about our children and that's a strong statement to me but I'm just talking from life experience mm -hmm. you know I went through that thing when they had all the race riots and out there I was on the Human Rights Commission here at that time as 
in 1969. And I went out there with the kid. I was chairman of the Education Committee, the Muncie Human Rights Committee. And some of the kids and parents called me and said, Mr. Goodall, we're having trouble out south side and somebody's going to get hurt. So I figured, you know, well, they were just talking because it's always something going at that time. But when I went to the meeting over at the Madison Street Y, I don't think, well, I guess it was Madison Street Y then, there were over 100 parents and kids over there. But when I walked in that room, I knew it was serious because mm -hmm. you don't never get 100 people together <laughs> upset mm -hmm. about anything unless it's really okay. serious, you know. And so that next morning I went over to... Uh, Keener Junior High School on this side of town where my son went to school and I knew the principal real well and I told him I said uh, Mr. Sport Williams uh, was the guy first anyway Williams was the principal's last name at South Side. I said he got a serious problem on his hand and he don't realize it. you know and he won't listen to anybody he said well Sport's a pretty good guy he's pretty fair early on and worry about him give me a whole lot of stuff so I still wasn't satisfied so I went to the police chief's office Mm -hmm. There was a black captain, John Casey, and he worked with human relations thing at the police department. And I found him, and we went in the chief's office, and I said, they got a serious problem at Southside, and somebody's going to get hurt. Well, the people up there don't wake up. And while I was in the office talking to the chief, the call came in that there's a riot going on at Southside High School, and them people couldn't see it coming, yeah. you know, and kids out there just beating the hell out of each other and broke one policeman's arm and mm -hmm. several kids got hurt you know they're fighting with tar tools and chains and mm -hmm. all that stuff and it was just because of insensitivity and uh, we went out there I think it was on a Friday I think that was a Monday when that fight started went on a Friday and talked to the principal and we had a group of students that kind of lead and they were just making excuses well this didn't happen that didn't happen and I don't know why they're so upset about this and all that stuff, when we got in the parking lot, <laughs> the kids looked at me and said, well, Mr. Goodall, we tried it your way and it didn't work. Now we're going to do it our way. Mm -hmm. And that's what those kids told us when we got out in the lot was four or five parents and myself and that Ms. Lavonna Dunworth was on my education committee. And her husband was a professor at Ball State. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you could see it coming if you were involved. Mm -hmm. Kids said, we gave you a chance, and you couldn't do it, so we're going to do it our So that Monday, they went up and took the flag down, and the white kid tried to put it back up, and the fight started. Okay. I was at the Central Southside basketball game a few weeks ago, and mm -hmm. um, after Southside won, there was a Southside mother that got out the flag and started chasing it. Mm -hmm. I was pretty surprised. Right. <laughs> I, I, just, she I just wonder sometimes people really know what that flag stands for. You know, it's yeah. just really strange to see this kid that with the Taliban now, and they call him traitor against the country. Well, them people actually tried to destroy the United States government, but they still were so. To me, yeah. the South were traitors. Uh, they say they were not, but they were fighting their government. Yeah. Somebody do what they tried to do today, overthrow the government. They would be thrown in jail. Mm -hmm. But they don't look at it that way. They glorify that insurrection. So I guess it's all how you look at it. So I don't know about it. If you look at it realistically, they don't want to look at it that way. But mm -hmm. it was really saying that we want to secede from the Union and destroy the government. And if you would do that today, they would impeach you. Put you before the firing squad. Hmm. Well, we um, we have uh, kind of we've started our outlines, you know, of course, mm -hmm. and we found out that we're gonna go ahead and go with the main theme of being like family, and we're gonna touch on religion because uh, these are just topics that have been coming up in mm -hmm. our other um, interviews. I'm sorry, religion, values, um, attitudes, and freedom, and freedom mm -hmm. was the other one. Uh, with values and manners and things like that, what type of um, values have you guys instilled in uh, your children and maybe even kids that you've, you know, worked with, you know? Well, we hope, you know, we've instilled, you know, the kind of values that, that 
you know, they understand that, you know, they're part of the human race and that they have a, a, a certain role to play, you know, as far as being human beings to interact with other people and respect other people's rights and their differences and, and all of that. I think the main thing that I feel the most satisfaction with, because something tangible, is that we have not only instilled in them the importance of education, but also that their children, mm -hmm. all of our grandchildren so mm -hmm. far have graduated from college that are that old, that are old enough. And in my generation, even though my mother was a college graduate, none of my brothers or I got a chance to go to college. And uh, so we have instilled that in them and so far, I guess five or six of, of the grandchildren have all graduated from college and was well, two of them still in there. Mm -hmm. No, the mm -hmm. one in Florida. Yeah. And, and Kim and Buster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Shocking, Taki, Angie. Mm -hmm. They've all graduated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all but. But anyway, we hope we've got our family to the point where their education is not complete until they at least get a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And then they can make up their mind whether they want to go on, get masters or mm -hmm. higher degrees. But I feel like if, if they have that door opener, then they can determine for themselves what kind of life they want. Because I always had to argue with my oldest son. He went to DePaul University down in Greencastle. He's on the football team. And he, he it came here to play Ball State one time. And the coach didn't let him start. And he was really upset he was going to quit the team. He said, I'm going to quit. And it didn't do me right. He said, all they want me to do is show the bus how to get to Ball State University. He said, that's all they want me to <laughs> I said, no, you aren't going to quit. I said, you don't want to go out for the team next season. That's all right. But you aren't quitting in the middle of the season. Once you start quitting, then you'll never succeed mm -hmm. at anything. So. Make a long story short, he he stuck it out and he stayed on the team until until he graduated from Paul State. And one time he really got angry with me and he said, well, Daddy, said, the only reason you want me to graduate from college so you can go out and brag that your son graduated from college. I said, no. I said, yeah, I said, no, that's not the reason. I said, the reason I want you to go, I said, I want you to have the opportunity, the best opportunities you can and that's the key that opens the door, is that college education. I said, if you want to be a wine head and sit on the corner and drink wine, let that be, be because that's what you want to do, mm -hmm. not because you don't have any choice. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, once you get the education, you can sit on the corner and drink wine if that's what you mm -hmm. choose to do, but that's your choice. Mm -hmm. It's not because you don't know anything and you can't do any better. Mm -hmm. And he tells me now that Dad said, you really talked to him. My youngest one's saying we got in that campus, and I was ready to kill him. <laughs> one of them called here. I was on the fire department. They didn't call here at 3.30 in the morning. I jumped out of bed. I knew half of downtown Muncie was burning down because that's the only time they call you when you got a second or third alarm. Because they said, oh, Mr. Goodall? I said, yes. This is the big brother. I said, tell the little brother, the big brother's hungry. Bring me something to eat. I said, you SOB, if you don't get off this phone, I'm going to come through this wire and wrap it around your damn neck and choke you with it. And I, took, I told her, I slammed that phone out to her, you better tell your brother, don't be caught here at that crazy stuff. I don't play them games, you know. Y'all can play with each other all you want to, but don't include me in your game. I'm surprised they did well, they, that like that. Normally, <laughs> oh, they, they're real oh, They did some terrible things. Did he cross? Yeah. Did he end up crossing, Captain? I don't know, I guess. He's still in there. He's still one of them. Oh, he's, where, where, where is he? he he's in Florida now. Yeah, he's Florida. a journalist. Okay, he's still but, I mean, he still affiliates with the yeah, then he is chapter. Still yeah, I don't, I don't understand all that turn stuff. Cause, you know, they're crazy because at that time, all they did was sit around helping kids figure out which class they had to go to and which one they didn't have mm -hmm. to go to. You know, they weren't trying to help anybody mm -hmm. learn something and get their lesson. They'd teach them how to dodge it. And, Cause he some of his buddies told left. him, said, that old man, I never forget, when Lou Engelhart was in the over the Department of Journalism out there, and so Fred got an F, and I went out there, and I said, Dr. Engelhart, I said, I want to talk to you about my son. He said, 
Well, Hurley said, usually we don't talk to the parents because the young men and young women mm -hmm. out here, and they're grown and stuff. Then he said, but since I know you, I'll tell you what happened with your son. He said, his Catholic brothers gave him some bad advice. They said, oh man, so old, you don't know whether any class or not, you don't have to go to class. He said, I saw your son the first day when he signed in and I didn't see him no more. The time for the finals, he said, I don't pass nobody mm. that doesn't come to class. And when I come home, I dig around this table. I told him, I'll kill you with my bare hands. <laughs> my mother, your mother, been going ragged in a can of sauerkraut. You aren't going to class. I said, I can understand if you're too dumb to learn, but I can't understand it when you aren't even going to class and trying. And we didn't have no more trouble out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody threatened to kill you. <laughs> he knew I meant it because I was... Yeah. Really but I had told he told you all the time he wasn't doing he anything. Me. She I kept saying he's not doing anything. Or he's not doing and he, he so he'd be all right. They just mess around as part of college. That's elective. Him. <laughs> he didn't even need it. But right. one thing I always insisted on, and I still do, is respect. Mm -hmm. When they don't have any respect for for themselves or mm -hmm. anyone else, I just mm -hmm. can't. Hate that. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing we definitely, and it's funny because we're touching on everything. Yes. We mm -hmm. were writing about respect too, and how mm -hmm. um, you, you have to have the self respect, of yeah. course. Mm -hmm. You know, that comes and then first. how nowadays you don't have respect much yourself. Lack of respect. You can't respect uh -huh. anyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's really important. You know, I, I don't think young people understand the importance of it early on in life, you know, because they all think everything's a big joke. Mm. What I didn't do today, I can do tomorrow and all that. But there comes a time when you have to accept responsibility, step up to the plate, because mm. people are dependent on you at some point in your life, and you affect more than just yourself mm. if you're irresponsible in that way. You hurt your family and your spouse and everybody else. Yeah. So it's just a matter of growing up. And a lot of times people don't want to grow up, <laughs> but they don't want to deal with them bills and all that other stuff. Yeah, I'm taking my time getting out of school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting out of school. Oh, I was like, you better hurry up and get up out of there and go play with my money. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, we definitely, because we have just like a list of questions that we're kind of going down. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wanted to ask about... Um, how your families were able to take part in your education when you were small. Because mm -hmm. that seems to be a pretty big theme in what everybody's talking about, mm -hmm. how families take part, either like going to the schools and helping out actually with the school work or else mm -hmm. like reading to the children when they're small and like teaching them the ABCs mm -hmm. and counting. How were your parents mm -hmm. able to do that? And then to Well, my parents didn't them. do much of that mm -hmm. because really? my, my mother, you know, she was Probably here by herself and yeah. she had her hands yeah. full trying to... Mm -hmm keep food on the table and doing all, all the other stuff. You know, she always told me to be a good boy and go to school and not cause any trouble. Mm -hmm. But her then her following statement would be because those people will hurt you. Mm -hmm. Now that was what my mother taught me. And uh, then, but that was the only way she knew how to protect me. You know, and I always mm -hmm. said that, that uh, one of the things that that embedded in me is that when I went in service in World War II, when I came home, the thing that I said is that I will never allow my children to be treated the way I was treated in the Muncie school system. And that's one reason I became involved and active in the Human Rights Commission and Civil Rights and all of that because I felt there were saying things that were not right. And if somebody didn't step up to the plate and do something about it, and I found a lot of other young boys that had gone and fought that came home and felt the same way. Mm -hmm. We knew the history of what happened to black men when they went to World War One and came back home to the Ku Klux Klan and all that stuff. And I said, hell, if I'm going to die overseas, I might as well die here if that's what it's going to take. And I felt strongly about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I didn't want my kids treated any better. I didn't want to treat them any worse, just treat them just like everybody else, you know. And uh, it, to me, that was just common sense and the right thing to do. And I didn't see any reason why why it couldn't be done. I didn't want no excuses. You know, I wanted because 
My mother would always tell me, say, Hurley, you go to school and be a nice boy because those people will hurt you. And I wasn't going to tell them. I said, you go and be a respectful of other people mm -hmm. and all, but don't let them mistreat you. Mm -hmm. And if they do, let me know, and I'll be there to see that what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that was the difference. Were her parents involved? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Your yeah, but, but, my, but my, I was, that's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. Our whole family was, was yeah, in, all her aunt, aunts and uncles came to their rescue when their parents mm -hmm. uh -huh. died, and we find out something different all the time. She, we'd been married for 50 years, and she didn't tell me that she went to elementary school. At Yacht and I went went there until my you know my sister came to we were had family reunion you know you start talking and she said you know you remember when we went to Alabama State and I said I sure <laughs> did and Hurley said you never told me that I said I I forgotten about that mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, it was a trial program and when the money was gone well mm -hmm. then they didn't didn't re renew it. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about the kids studying, um, we had a time for them to study. Mm -hmm. Don't come messing around with me so far. Can I do so and so? May I do? May? May I, mother? May I? I said, you get your lesson. And I mean, go in there and get through with mm -hmm. it. And, and then you can. Have the rest of the day of prayer. Uh huh. Yep. Mm -hmm. So they don't have any. Some kids come in and start watching TV, they, they're not turning that TV on and, and looking and looking over the book and, and looking back right at the there. TV. My sister, no, like that. my sister, my younger sister, <laughs> it's three of us, it's, um, we all have totally different personalities. Mm -hmm. My older sister is like more of the business mm -hmm. lawyer type person. My younger sister is the brain of the family and then I'm just kind of thrown in the mix of there. But my younger sister... I don't know how she studies, but she watches TV, mm -hmm. listens to the radio, mm -hmm. and does her homework all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Karma, what are you doing? How are you doing that? You know, how are you concentrating on your work? And she just goes along. And mm -hmm. I tell her, I'm always tell, you know, mm -hmm. telling her all the time. Even here, you know, I tell her. <laughs> I'm like, Mom, Karma's watching TV and listening to her. And my mom was like, well, if that's her way of studying, as long as she's bringing home her A's, then she can do what she wants to. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And she gets mm -hmm. A's. You know, mm -hmm. she's the smartest one. Well, some people can do that. Yeah. Some, some people can. Some people can. Yeah, they can mm -hmm. that, yeah. And she can't do without Most it, can. though. Most she of has can. to. Yeah, yeah she has can. to have all of that going on yeah. to, mm -hmm. get, to stay focused. If not, if, like, if there's silence, she can't do it. Mm -hmm. For some reason. It's just so weird. I'm like, yeah. I can't have anything yeah. at all. Yeah. yeah. I, I need pretty much quiet when mm -hmm. I'm really trying to mm -hmm. do something. You know, I don't like a lot of distractions. Mm -hmm. That's but just right, you can do 40 on. things at once. Yeah. You can have 45 yeah. projects going. Yeah, but that's different. They're all compartmentalized. She's talking about the TV going, the radio, and the record player. Yeah. yeah. You have fun. that. Yeah. <laughs> you have that. I'm like, I remember just reading over um, in, in the archives, and I'm thinking, where in the world did he have all this time to do anything? He's on this board, this board, and then writing books here, writing papers here. And I'm like, oh, where did he have time? Like, man. Well, I, I became obsessed with the, the history part of it mm -hmm. you know, when I retired, really before I did. But then when I had the time, I said, that's what I want to do mm -hmm. for the rest of my life, try to fill that gap. So I like a pack rat, you know, everything I get my hands on, I would save it. I finally took a lot of it out there and gave it to the archives mm -hmm. when I retired from legislation. <laughs> I bet they saw all that junk. <laughs> <laughs> They'd laughed at some of that stuff. I found I'd left some stuff in there I shouldn't have left in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What other kinds of things did you do with um, when your boards were small, like to promote them in education? I was fortunate in the family. I would take my kids to ball games and encourage them to participate in sports and I was a bowler I bowled a lot with mm -hmm. league men's leagues and the youngest boy the one that's a sport writer now he would go and I taught him how to keep score for a bowling team mm -hmm. and he would go and he and them older guys they loved the one because they didn't have to keep score mm -hmm. he would sit there at the table keep score for us and I remember 
he liked to figure batting averages and all that kind of stuff. And I taught him how to use a slide rule. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how all that, his, his love for sports and all that's the way that developed. Mm -hmm. So I kind of encouraged him in that. But I encouraged both of them in mm -hmm. that because, God, I don't know how many football games, basketball yeah. games, them football games, you sit out in the rain and snow that's like we didn't have good sense. And that's so one thing. If our kids were playing, we were going to be there. I was going to say, that's one thing. We didn't yeah. send our kids. We took them mm -hmm. and took everybody else's. Yeah. <laughs> they would load yeah. the car down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Earl would be on duty, so I'd end up hauling all these kids to the ball game. Half of the players. Mm. You know. Well, she would meet the bus like they'd play mm. out of town. They'd get back about midnight. And I'd and set them on the only parent over there, the black parent over there. Yeah. And one night she, I said, where's Hurley Jr.? <laughs> the, the car was full. The car, the car was full. Oh, she said, I'll come over and get my son. Well, y'all got to get out and get mine in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, yeah. But, you know, it's just real, it's just real funny. You would run into these kids. Uh, yeah, we had one stop here stop the, the other day. The other day. Uh, he was here from San Diego. California. Now he's over all the gateway stores in the United States. Oh. Uh -huh. He graduated from Purdue University. Nice. He uh, and money, he's money, going, money. Oh, he's yeah, a he's real good, good. Yeah, he said he had real good. Sixty stores. Mm -hmm. he, was over he has them all across the country. Mm -hmm. And his dad was sick, and but every time he comes to Muncie, he comes. Yeah. He comes by here because we raise him just like. Like he he, he, he was, was over here, and. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, which was at his house. Mm -hmm. They were just yeah. And there was a story to that. I was that's when I was on the Human Rights Commission. This guy was a professor at Ball State. His name was Charlie Battle. And I told him, I said, "There's a kid coming out of Central High School that's second in his class, and it built a computer when he was in the sixth grade mm -hmm. at Longfellow Elementary School, and he's not going to get to go to college because his dad is a drunk and throws his money away." And all that. He said, "I don't believe you, good all. I don't believe that." I said, "Well, go check on it." And sure enough, he did, and he found out he was telling the truth. And he was a member of the Purdue Club here in Muncie, whatever. I don't know, I guess it's men, I don't know if it's Purdue men anyway. Mm -hmm. And they found out about it, and they looked into it, and they, they sent him to Purdue University, mm -hmm. and that's how he got that education. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's gone on now. Yeah, he's I know he's not. He, he, is, my he, he is just a, yeah. And he was always a gentleman. Yeah. Yeah, we, but we just kids. didn't, that was just my, I, one of my pet peeves. People just let their kids mm -hmm. carry yeah. on and disturb mm -hmm. everybody. But we would always work with our kids, kids too. I know one time they was on the football team and, and they, got, oh, they got mad. The black boys got mad at the white boy. They said, man, the white boys won't throw the ball to us. We ain't going to throw it to them and all that. Mm -hmm. you know, we ain't going to block for them. They don't block for us. And I said, no, you can't win like that. You know, you have to play together and all that stuff. And I know we had them right down here. My wife fixed hot dogs and baked beans and potato chips and all. We mm -hmm. taught them kids that this is not going to work, you know. Either you guys are going to play together. You had all the white and the black boys? Mm -hmm. yeah. had everybody. Yeah, I had everybody. Uh -huh. And they went that next can week we and went to Indianapolis. Can we go? Can we go? Indianapolis can we Cathedral go? was the number one football team in the state, and they went over and beat them. Mm -hmm. And then they were all right. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember that cow. Yep. So we've had busy, busy lives. We had busy lives with the kids. <laughs> but we enjoyed it. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I, I encourage my kids, you know, to participate mm -hmm. in sports because I think, and I could see when they found out they could, they were good at doing something, it increased their self confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that oldest boy, he didn't know he could run. And he was really strange because he started running about the seventh grade in middle school. He found out he could outrun anybody over there. But when he got to high school, he wouldn't run track. I said, why don't you run track? I said, you can win the 100 yard dash in 220. He said, that's just stupid, Dad, just getting up there and just running to be running. He said, don't make no sense to me. Now, he played football and baseball and basketball, mm -hmm. but he would not run track. And he was a fast kid in his time. <laughs> but I could see his self-confidence develop once he found out he could outrun all those other boys. Mm -hmm. And their whole attitude seemed to change toward him. You know, they began to kind of look at him as a leader mm -hmm. of the group rather than just one of the pack. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And that's what gives you self-confidence if you find out you can do something well. I'll tell you something funny. You know, when, when it snowed one night, it started snowing and it kept snowing and snowing, and Sherman was next door, and he and uh, he and our son were talking on the phone, and I guess he said, "Well, maybe I'll see you tomorrow. I don't know." And Hurley and uh, Hurley Junior said, "I know who will be there. There'll be three people. There'll be Sherman Bell, Hurley Goodall, and Burl Clark. Burl Clark's the principal." So he said, we won't get to school. stay home and rest. He said, and see, they didn't know we were listening. They were talking. He said, be three people up to that school. <laughs> he knew. He knew he was going if the if school was open. They were going to school. It took off because he's an educator now. Uh, honey, loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Won't come out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He and feels sorry for those kids. And kids and they do them. have some doozy there. Yeah. They live in Akron, yeah. Ohio. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. That's, um, what, what, is that, um... Just south of Cleveland. Yeah, I was say, what college is up there? Is that... Akron University is there, and then, uh, Kent State. Kent State, is close by. Uh-huh. But Kent, Ohio, is just a few miles. Oh, okay. That's how he got up there, because his wife at that time got a some Fulbright scholarship or something to go mm -hmm. to Kent State, so they left here, yeah, went there, yeah. and, and then they broke up, and he just stayed up there, mm -hmm. married another lady. And I think every time it snowed, he's in that snow belt, he <laughs> get two or three <laughs> feet of snow, he's ready to come out, <laughs> so he stays. Both of both those kids were doing what they liked, because Fred, I think he do that sports stuff for free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then Hurley won't, he, he, he worries about the kids, his kids. And it's funny, we'd be walking down the street and they'd say, well, hi, Mr. Goodall, hi, Mr. Goodall, and they're, you know, the same size he is and taller and bigger. <laughs> Yeah, they don't forget those mm -hmm, kids. They yeah. tell us all the time. Remember coming over and eating that fried chicken? Uh, all tell us, yes. <laughs> we got to stay together. <laughs> Man. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you guys would have definitely had, uh, with you being in the um, involved in the school so much, did you ever have any um, bad incidents with teachers, like any run ins with teachers? No. With schools? With, I did. With your children? Yeah, I had some. But, you know, we worked through it. But most of my, as far as our kids are concerned, yeah. when they start that new math stuff, oh, you yeah. know, and I could tell that my oldest son was not getting it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I went over, he's in junior high school then. I went over and I knew the teacher and I said, I can't think of the name now. But anyway, I said, I don't think Hurley Jr. Dick Wiley. Yeah, Dick Wiley. <laughs> I don't think he's, you know, what's going on? I said, he said, well, he's doing as well as any of them. I said, well, <laughs> hell, he ain't doing nothing. He ain't none of them doing anything. You know, and so I, I also knew the director of mathematics in the school system. So he was at Central High School at that time. So I went up there, and I talked to him. I said, this new math, I think you got teachers trying to teach it that don't know what they're doing because my son can't explain to me what he's doing. And he said, well, Hurley, he said, you know, when you went to school and they had you do divide a, a fraction and you reverse the numerator and the denominator and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. said, I said, yeah. He said, well, you just did it because we told you to do it that way. He said, this new math tells them why they do it that way. I said, well, will you explain to me why they do it that way? <laughs> that funniest look came over that man's face. He couldn't tell me nothing. <laughs> no, he done read that in a book somewhere. And when I said, no, y'all screwing these kids up because the people that are teaching them don't understand what they're trying to teach them. And uh, he did. He had a devil time hmm. with math. They just screwed a whole generation of kids, and they had already out there at Burris, it screwed up a whole generation of kids with sight reading and no phonics. Hmm. And uh, there's, there's a guy on the fire department. He wrote for the Muncie newspaper, wrote the fishing column and hunting column like that. And every time he'd write a paper, they'd have to give it to somebody, and they'd have hmm. to check the spelling. Yeah, the guy couldn't spell. 
because he went through Burris Lab School with that sight reading and he couldn't sound out a word and even come close to spelling it. There's one, a lot of things that. One other thing, the, in all of this, um, we still were caregivers to Hurley's mother. Mm -hmm. how, how old was mom when she died? She was 99 and a half. Mm -hmm. 99 and a half. Mm -hmm. And um, we had kept her, you know, took care of her. Mm -hmm. And. Um, until until that time, mm -hmm. and so I don't know how we did all that stuff, but we did it. Yeah, not on target. Our life's on twenty-four yeah. hours a day, you know, every other day, and, and then I have three days off. I'm not doing all that stuff because I'm tired and I'm doing it no more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. Then when I left the legislature, the first thing she said was. Well, who gonna take care of me while y'all down at the legislature? <laughs> yeah, I went to all of the stuff that her that um, Shirley was involved with down there. So, yeah, yeah, she was a good help. She broke me in with she got me in with those legislators. Oh, yeah. Well, she'd go out with their wives and they'd come home and say, Boy, I missed that off really nice to be in on the next day that guy come to me and said, My wife with your wife and she said she says nice guy hadn't even talked to me before. <laughs> you know. I worked with the broke ladies. a lot of hot ice for me, you know, and, and then she was president of that legislative wise group in mm -hmm. 1985 and 86, and we hosted the national convention, 17,000 people in Indianapolis mm. that year. Mm -hmm. We did something they never had done before. They ran a special 10 lap, 500 mile race for those legislators. They never have done that before, mm. but they did it for the Indiana legislature. They have to have the state police every time they run that 500 mile race. And we didn't authorize it. The state police couldn't vote. Mm. So they said, We want to do something nice for the legislature. Since you're having them from all over the country, we'll run a special 10 lap race for legislators from all around the country. And that's the only time that's been done in the history of the 500 mile track. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so. Your mom was well cared for. She was a doozy. And she did. <laughs> she deserved. She deserved it. Yeah, she. She yeah. really did. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really appreciate my wife. I'm not many guys. Wife put up with her mother <laughs> like she did, especially when I was at the power station a lot. Freddie had to be here with me, but mm -hmm. she was pretty good until at last years and she got cantankerous and mm -hmm. sick all the time mm -hmm. couldn't satisfy her but we made it yep <laughs> well we we're born together. yeah no uh -huh. uh, no i was gonna ask uh, when the kids were young like when you said that your son came home and he didn't get the new math that they were teaching um, was that something that he felt comfortable asking you guys like because you really promoted education or did you have to ask him every day, you know, what are three things that you learned today? Cause oh yeah, cause I'd always ask him what yeah. they were studying and I asked him to explain, explain what the difference between new math and traditional math mm -hmm. was to me. Yeah. And he couldn't explain it to me <laughs> because no one had explained it to them. Uh -huh. You know, they just bought all, bought all of this stuff that these people come in just like when they had open concept schools, you know. And I was on the school board when all that was going on, and we'd go to these conventions and they'd talk about, well, when they go out in the business world, they're going to be in these banks where there's no walls and <coughs> all this stuff and everything. Mm -hmm. So we need open concept schools so they can learn how to function mm -hmm. in these open environments and all. You know, now they've gone back to school, put walls up in them, because mm -hmm. the teachers couldn't deal with the openness, and they yeah. said one class disturbed another class and all that kind of stuff. So. They've tried a lot of experiments in schools that have harmed several generations of kids yeah. because somebody, for whatever reason, whether they was a contract that built school buildings or what it was, they <laughs> start those kind of fads mm -hmm. and we'd end up doing them. But, you know, traditional teaching is probably the best way I know the subjects have to change because there was no such thing as a computer when I was in school. So you have to change with the times. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's some tried and true 
methods of teaching children. It worked, and the more we get away from them, the more screwed up the kids are. <laughs> yeah. What do you think the most important ways of teaching are? Well, I think there are some basic things, you know, and most of it is repetition. Mm -hmm. You know, if you do something, if you just write and spell mm -hmm. enough, you'll learn how to spell. And if you can phonetically spell out a word, you might miss it a little bit, but you aren't going to miss it that bad, you know. But if you just try to learn every word, what it looks like, and how to spell, you'll never be able to master that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just too much to, to ask. I don't know how many words there are in the dictionary, but it's too many to memorize them all. So you have to find some other way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And mathematics the same way. The more you do it, the better you get. Mm -hmm. And I know when I was a kid at the elementary school, and they would put the boys against the girls at the blackboard, you know, to solve the problem. And they were just simple, you know, addition or subtraction, wasn't anything fancy like fractions and all that kind of stuff. And when the teacher, I grew up and the teacher would give the problem, you know, he like he'd say, add 678 and 942. I could just write the answer down. Mm -hmm. And the girl was writing the problem down, and they say, "That's right, you beat her." They say, "You cheating, her because you didn't write." <laughs> He'd say, "Write the problem down." He asked what the answer was, and that's what I wrote down. And uh, that's the first teacher that I had that encouraged me and said, "Girl, you have a special talent. You should, you know, study hard and use it." And all. And he was the first guy that that encouraged, first teacher I had that really encouraged me. That must have been about the fifth grade at that time. So, and there were a few others. The one that I remember most was in high school because our family had been on welfare, so I started working in the factory when I was 16 during World War II. And we'd go at, at 2 o'clock in the morning, get off at 10, and be up to Central by 10.30 and go to school till 3.30. And I did that during my junior and senior year. And one day I went to sleep in my history class, and I guess I was snoring because when I woke up, everybody was laughing, you know. And I heard Miss O'Hara, woman named Frances O'Hara, I'll never forget it. She said, don't laugh at Hurley. She said, he has to work to help his mother. Just be glad you don't have to do what he has to mm. do. And them kids never laughed at me again when I'd be dozing off. And I always appreciate that old woman mm -hmm. doing that. <laughs> you were the only person who liked her. <laughs> <laughs> I know, probably right. In the whole school. <laughs> yeah, she'd take me over there and help clean her apartment up. She had all them corsets hanging up in there, and I'd get her and laugh. <laughs> 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 she, uh, she was a big lady. Yeah, she was big. Old. But oh, she sure man. did. She she looked out for me. Yeah. I was getting there to laugh again when I dozed off in there. I'm not surprised that she let you slide, you know. She did. I was a pretty good student. I, you know, like I could, I could spell good. I had strong suit in spelling. I could spell. I could add, you know, mathematics good. The only thing I hated was English, because I never had an English teacher I liked. I hated them English teachers. <laughs> so, witches. <laughs> but, uh. Evidently, they did me some good because I turned out to be a pretty prolific writer. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like them verbs and adverbs and nouns <laughs> and pronouns mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. That's I hated my, that's that. my passion. Yeah. Oh, well, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> if you learn the basics, it'll help you all the rest of your life. Yeah. But there's not too much written word now. It's all computerized and everything, mm -hmm. so I don't know how that's going to change people's skills and all. I know it'll change their handwriting skills, mm -hmm. because they won't sit down and write much yeah. for hand. I'll be on computer, email, and all that stuff. Who were some of your other yeah. encouraging teachers when you were coming through school? My other what? The other encouraging teachers. You said that you had a few that really mm -hmm. pushed you and encouraged you. Like, do you have any the ones that really stand them? out were those two, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Ms. O'Hara and Harry Ray was the male teacher when I was in fifth grade. Uh, there were others, you know, that that I liked and got along mm -hmm. well with, but those
those are the two that really I thought cared something about me more than just a student sitting in the classroom. Mm -hmm. well, what about you? Did you have any really caring teachers that really helped you to get through? Yeah, she was Kathleen Meehan. Oh, yeah. Her pet. I that, well, I wasn't her pet. <laughs> <laughs> the kids did say that, though. <laughs> She was an English teacher. Miss she was Christy. really nice. And she was a real popular teacher there, there mm -hmm. in Central. And then that lady you worked for. Christy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what Christy Woods is named after that lady. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. her and so I would go over and do help her do things on Saturday. Mm -hmm. I'd forgotten about that too. You know, after so many things, you know, you things come back to you, but mm -hmm. you just don't, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. People forget, that's all. So. He's got to be reminded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they, they would, they would all, you know, they would hire, you know, black girls to help at their home and mm -hmm. all, you know, back mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. days and all. And I know, I think it was in 64 or something. Anyway, the newspaper asked me to write this column. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time I was upset, so. When I ended the column, I said, uh, you know, I said, it's interesting to me that I had a black firefighter that I worked with that came to me and said, Hurley, do you know a, a nice colored girl that I can get to come and clean up my house and all that? And, you know, I got thinking, I said, well, I might be able to find one, though, you know. And I, then, then I got mad after he said. So next week I went back, told him, I said, do you know a nice young white girl that could come clean up my house for me? And he got madder in hell. I said, what's the difference? You know, if it's a black girl, she's supposed to be happy. But if it's a white girl, it's an insult to come clean my house, even though I'm willing to pay her. It's like you're willing to pay, pay the black girl. And that was a part of the racism that was built into our society that people didn't, realize was there. I mm. said, you would say about the black girl, she refused it. Well, there's another one too lazy at work. But if it was your daughter that a black person asked to come and clean their house, mm. you would be insulted. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a job. They're paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Are you so, okay on that chair? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what was your connection to um, Vivian Conley? Mm -hmm. Conley, Vivian Conley. Conley. Oh, uh, we were a team. We helped, uh, really, Vivian was active, you know, all through her life, you mm -hmm. know, helping mm -hmm. young people, particularly. And she worked with the Reverend J.C. Williams, who was mm -hmm. pastor of Trinity Baptist uh, United Methodist Church. And uh, he was in the middle of the civil rights fights here and, and led the, the black coalition, community coalition and all through a lot of that stuff, but where I really work closely with Vivian is that we started a thing to try to get kids and young kids in college, and there was a program mm -hmm. called the Groups Program at Indiana University. Yes, G99. Yeah. yeah. Group 99 is where yeah. I am, yeah. yeah. So we took I don't know how many kids down there mm -hmm. at IU and got them enrolled, and a I lot of them are... You said Williams? No, that's not out here. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, Roselle Boyd. Roselle Boyd Boy. was down there for that program when I was there. You know Roselle. He's from Indianapolis. He's on the Indianapolis City County Council now. Yes, I think he was Boy. professor. And then what's that lady's name from Greencastle? Was Ken the. Because Williams right now is the director of. Um, I don't know. I can't remember, not remember her first name, but Williams um, and um, Moore. Mon Mon Marley, Mon Monroe, Monroe, something like that. There's two ladies, a black and a white lady. Miss Wiggins, I'm sorry, Wiggins Wait. is her name. Miss yeah, uh, Wiggins. Of course, this was probably yeah. 25 years ago. Uh -huh. when we were yeah, because when you long. started, when it started, yeah. you yeah, and Roselle was, was over that program. Mm -hmm. and that Roselle lady was from Green Greencastle. We'd go down there and take those take those kids. Yeah, yeah car loaded with kids and go down and. Uh, at mm -hmm. the Upper Bound program at Purdue University. Mm -hmm. We would take kids up there, and I never, we took them up there one time, and computers were just coming into being and all. 
and these kids that come all the way from Cincinnati and Chicago and Louisville, Kentucky, and all around, and they were talking about Fortran and Backtran and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And our kids had never heard them, mm -hmm. those words. You know, they didn't know what mm -hmm. they were talking about. But in those big city school systems, they were already teaching oh, yeah, young people, you know, to work with, with computers. But I look at these kids now, you know, when they come back home and they have gone on and they become real successful and everything, and they live all over the country now, California, mm -hmm. and of course, Indianapolis, and Don, and San Diego, yeah. and all those kids that we helped. It's really rewarding to Rabbits see them. Rabbits out there. Yeah. Teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Group was group was a really good experience with IU. Mm -hmm. That's good. You get swallowed up, you know, at a large campus sometimes. You know, it it just depends on, you know, what your tastes are mm -hmm. and how you mm -hmm. deal with it. But I agree, it's a, kind of a scary experience to go and dump a eighteen, nineteen year old child in a place with mm. four to fifty thousand people mm. running around. Mm. <laughs> they had a tough adjustment fun, to make. Some some do it easier than others. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing is that some of them are too easily misled by some of those that aren't there to learn nothing. Mm. They're there to party and play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. and you listen to them too much, you end up partying and playing instead of learning. Mm. But most Young people will adjust and make the adjustment and get serious when time to get serious. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't think that young of ours was going to make it, but he did. Uh -huh. he's, he's doing he's, real well. He's quiet. Both of my kids are pretty quiet, though. Yeah. Yeah, they were You used to be. Yet. You used to be. Well, I've always been quiet. Yeah. <laughs> but not now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, I wasn't going to tell that part. I have to say, you can't keep saying that word. Oh, well. <laughs> Don't talk like that. Have to, yeah. have to keep reminding. Yeah, I get carried away sometimes, but you know, when you're fooling with me people it's frustrating sometimes it really is mm -hmm. some concepts that are simple to me seem difficult for them to grasp sometimes mm -hmm. and I just rather be straightforward with somebody tell me what you think I can deal with it you can't handle it that's your problem mm -hmm. I just don't yeah. ask yeah. <laughs> yeah. That way you always have the air cleared and everybody knows mm -hmm. where everybody's coming from and you can you can deal with that even if you don't agree with what the final outcome is. You know, everybody said what they had to say and no one can go away deluded about what was said or mm -hmm. who agreed to what or anything. You don't agree, say I don't agree. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just the way it is. So I think it stands you in good stead. See a lot of headaches. I've seen a lot of people get in trouble because they were afraid to say what they really thought and somebody assumed that they agreed with them. And later on they found out that they didn't and they felt they'd deceived. Well, I asked you about that and you told me you didn't have no opinion or it was all right with you or something like that. So I said, let them know. Yeah. Yep. When you guys were young, how did your families discipline you to know how to act and how not to act? What was the discipline like? Oh, my mother didn't spare no pain. pain. <laughs> <laughs> That's she why. Let you go get your own switch to move. look behind. Go out there and get that limb off that tree. And but you, you know, my sisters uh, laugh and tell Hurley, tell Hurley that. Uh, Freddie would just go tattle everything, tattle everything, and say, she never, she never, she never gets a whipping. She never gets a whipping. They didn't have to whip me very much. She'd go tell everything. They would, they just wouldn't have to, you know, because if I was supposed to do something, I just did it in the first place. And 
Uh, but Louise said, you just you used to tell everything you knew. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, you got as many children around as you guys had, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. because of the six of us, mm -hmm. and uh, my aunt had two children of her own, so mm -hmm. she said they had, right away, they had eight mm -hmm. children there. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, we, how they did it, but <laughs> they did it. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing that doesn't have anything to do with this, that you won't believe. <laughs> we built this house. Really? Really? Me and he. Really? Uh huh. Built this house. We can yeah. tell you where. How long the... does it take? I mean, <laughs> you, know, like, you guys, like, you know, of course. We didn't have no choice. We didn't, we didn't have enough money to do what we wanted to do, we so did. we did it ourselves. So. Mm -hmm. I had some help from a few guys on the fire department that helped me with a few things and all, but. Basically. Pipes and everything? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Are you serious? You yes, I'm serious. Well, I mean, I know. I know <laughs> you are. Yes, I'm serious. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to leave that out. <laughs> oh, yeah. golly. Yeah. I, another guy we myself, we, we did home remodeling on our days off on the fire department. Mm -hmm. We did it for one of the banks here when they'd repossess a home. They would hire us to go in and clean it up and paint it and refurbish it and all. So. I knew how to do it with just the time because I was 24 hours on, 24 off. But you get a lot done 24 hours, but then that next 24 hours, we was at the firehouse and we couldn't do anything. So, but we did it in the summer, like we started the first of March, mm -hmm. and we moved in the first of August. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we still had wow. some work to do. They right? didn't believe we were done. But you know, like they that. said, "No, you're not done." I said, yeah, I'm ready for you. <laughs> yeah. When was that? 1960. I'll never forget. <laughs> I won't forget. <laughs> and I won't forget standing up under the cabinets. One of the firemen was going to come and help him hang those cabinets in the kitchen. And he didn't show up. So... <laughs> it really rigged up this thing for me to hold, I stand up on him <laughs> to balance it, you know, until he got the screws started, you know. We got those cabinets up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I tell yeah, people all the time, that, you know, that was a case of they you said, do what you, 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 you want to do, do with, with what you got, because at that time, a great big the, hole bank, here. the banks would not loan you the money to this build guy, a house in this uh -huh. area, the community, just so much. They yeah. told us, they did us a favor. Really they didn't care. Favor, because they said that they would not loan anybody over $8,000 to build a house in this area. Mm -hmm. We built this house for $8,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the house wow. payments were $64 a month. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I believe that. But it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was talking to the Wilsons and he was saying how they lived off of $3. Mm -hmm. um, when well I lived off with their groceries, they would come mm -hmm. home with like a car fill of bags off of three dollars. Mm -hmm. And then how he was making nineteen dollars a week or something, and and they were like, they thought they were rich, you know, got the car payment and then the house payment and then you know extra activities and stuff like that. And I'm just like, wow, are you yeah. serious? Yeah, I think I make sixty five cents an hour at that time. Maybe about nineteen sixty or something like that. Maybe that's. I think mean, that's when I was first started. See. But anyway, if I tell kids now that I paid a house payment $64 a month, they don't believe <laughs> that I did. Taxes is more than that now. <laughs> but people would pass and say, they're not, they're not gonna get that done. And I was working at the hospital at that time. Mm -hmm. I was working, I worked mm -hmm. three to, to 11, so. And I'd get ready to go, you know, Hurley would plan what we're going to do the next day, you know, and have it all written out. So I had my little jobs to do, mm -hmm. and then I'd go on to work. Man, I thought that was nice just seeing it come together. Yeah, uh-huh. And, uh, but I, you just couldn't imagine this great big hole over here because this is the bottom level. You want, we want to 
that split le level home. <laughs> oh, I've been it was, right. really, it was a lot less expensive to build a, a basement park than it was to build it out. Mm -hmm. You don't know, spread it out that much more. It was a lot cheaper because I think at that time you could buy cement for about ten dollars a yard. And cement blocks were about fifteen cents a piece. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole lot different than what it is now. Mm. The we old basement probably didn't cost us five hundred dollars mm -hmm. at that time. But we did all the work, poured the cement. I had a buddy, pressed them out. And did uh huh. It. If we had stuff, stuff lined out each day for what had to be done, and then I heard we go home and you do your book work that night. Mm -hmm. I always do. It. His book work before he. That's I could pay them people. I told them to mm -hmm. go the lumber out there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that it? Just went. It went smooth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we didn't have in trouble at all. I don't think it even rained on this house before we got rough on it. Mm -hmm. That was Bless unusual. Mm -hmm. That was a blessing. In there. It never, never rained until. We got the roof on, the windows in, and the doors. Then you could come in and work, mm -hmm. you know, all night long if you wanted to, because they had electricity. But when you were doing the outside, the walls and the roof, and all that, you just had that daylight that you could work. Mm -hmm. Once we got in closed, we could work all night, Sundays and any time as long as you had the material. So, but I was holidays, <laughs> weekend. Thirty years old, and that made a big difference. <laughs> we clear off the subject. <laughs> That's what I said. I was just saying, saying that, and I said it was off the subject. Was you going to show them part of your book over? Where is it? Right there on that table. Oh. You ever seen a White House inaugural invitation? Mm -mm. I was going to let you get up to here in the first one. Well, I didn't want to put you out. I'll just get this far away. You want to put me, putting me out? I'll see here. Okay. Oh, I'm fine here. Would you like a coat? Did oh. you guys go? Yeah, we went. This one went to the White House. And Did I think oh. Oh. We were dancing in the East Room with the President and his wife. Wow. Yeah. I looked up, I said, there's a that black kid that, from Muncie, that, Indiana. That white from Muncie, right? Indiana, dancing in the White House with the President and his wife. But we met him. I met him early in his President's campaign. The way it happened, I knew a lady that was a legislator in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Lottie Shackelford was her name. She later became the mayor of Little Rock. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when there was about five or six of them guys out there that time, and so I called her and I said, "What about this Clinton guy? What guy is?" And she was real high on him. Mm -hmm. So he came to Indianapolis, and we went down there. He came for a press conference, and I met him and told him that I knew Lottie Shackelford from the legislature out there and all. We got to talking and. Next thing I know, the state chair lady came to me and said, he's getting ready to have a press conference out to W with that public television station in Indiana. Mm -hmm. They were mm -hmm. telecasting it all over the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And would you guys come and help make up the audience? You know, call mm -hmm. We need an audience in the mm -hmm. studio. So we went, and we was out there for about five hours with that guy. Mm -hmm. That before he ever got the nomination or anything. Mm -hmm. So then uh, we ended up going to the National Convention in New York when he was nominated. And I never, every time I hear that song, Don't Stop Thinking mm -hmm. About Tomorrow, mm -hmm. that was the theme song of that 1992 hmm. presidential convention. And I'll never forget that. So, but these are just pictures of the White House. 
That test was done. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was the Christmas time, and that's what was so nice in the White House. Anyway, that's all them trees and things around there. And uh, this is the Capitol. Capitol building. Uh, Capitol building. That's me who went around to check the gate where we go in. And you know, Freddie took a picture of me there. Demonstrators in the park. That's the capital. The mall. Washington Monument. I'm flipping them. That's Freddie out there with the pigeons on them all. <laughs> and all the music museums and things. I was trying He's to get up there. That was a tree of what red and white pine set. It's a Christmas tree in the Airspace Museum there. Pretty. But anyway, let me get on back here to the White House. Yeah, that's when you go in and the guards meet you there at the door. She dressed in her fur, man. Mm. Cleaner and be a big John. <laughs> <laughs> and Carolers met us at the door. And these old guys, they really looked out for us there in the White House. It was really funny. They probably the only few blacks there they gonna take care of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really was. And this is in the hall with the Pre president. Pro yeah, portraits of presidents. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, Freddie, she was a good camera person. She took care of all them. Took all them shots of me playing president. That's the door that he goes through when he's going out on the portico to have press mm -hmm. conference mm -hmm. there at the White House. That's where that seal is. That's the door the president goes out of the White House. And Santa Claus got that dance. Mm -hmm. But it was... And this was the Indiana State Chair Lady at that time, Ann Delaney. I don't know if you ever heard that name. Her husband and daughter. We were the only ones from Indiana there. But I knew all those other men found out it was people who were on his bandwagon early on. And this is the red room there where the everything china. was red, mm -hmm. all that china. Mm -hmm. And this was the west room where they served big old buffet. You can right tail and get all you want, everything. And you're so excited you can't eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know. Yeah. And of course, that's official Christmas Christmas tree there. Something from every state on that tree. Mm. Yeah. That's fresh. But you know, you just went uh, went around there to offer to work, tell them you wanted to work, you wanted to help them. And they were setting up the office, remember? Mm -hmm. We were over there in Indianapolis and went there. And so they this said they were- This guy's a legislator from Missouri. Mm -hmm. And he had his girlfriend, he didn't have no camera. He said, good <laughs> all, will you take my picture with my lady? <laughs> yeah, I took it and he called me 10 times. He called up before we got it. <laughs> Well, I got the film. And we get you the film developed right away. We always yeah, do. I think uh -huh. he's a state senator out there now. Yeah. I got a letter from him begging for money. Uh -huh. but, and these are carolers that were there for us. Yeah. yeah. That's him right there. His girlfriend. Somebody took that for her. Ready and flirting with Santa Claus. <laughs> I hadn't thought about showing, showing this, <laughs> this album. <laughs> that's, I think that's John Dingle, and Con from Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was in he was in the power seat then. The Democrats in control that out. House of Representatives. That was beautiful. That hallway there with oh, all those yes. trees. Everything in that in that place. But 
Anyway, that's enough of that. I don't think it's anything. It's Miss Clinton. I think that's when they came in, first came into the room. So when I started taking pictures, people started getting in front of them. Yeah, hey, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, they came and talked to us and they started dancing with us. Your interest in politics, did your kids ever get interested in like student government or not really? Not they, really. They just really? my oldest son is just now getting interested because mm -hmm. they're messing with education funding mm -hmm. in Ohio and he calls in buses at the government the time, yeah. <laughs> and writes me these real long long letters and all the time I was talking to him couldn't get him interested in nothing. Mm -hmm. But now he's really young ho and his oldest daughter has worked for their congressman up there, so he's gotten more interest in it. But the youngest one, he just sports nut. Mm -hmm. That's all he cares about. He, uh, he was at the Super Bowl and at the NBA All-Star game. But Fred got that yeah, from you. I know. Yeah, he's a good, he he's does a, a good writer. job. You know what I mean? He can mm -hmm. express himself. Mm -hmm. and Did he write a lot when he was young? Did he write, like, short stories or anything? Or? I read, but he played games all the time. Uh -huh. His friends always say you can't beat Fred at his own game. So <laughs> practice. He work this end, uh -huh. and then he'd, then he'd turn that thing around, and then he'd work on this end. Mm -hmm. Just one person playing. That's what, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He played chess like he like played that. against himself. Mm -hmm. He did that hours at a time, and couldn't get him to read anything but sports books. Now, he'd read anything about Jackie Robinson or <laughs> mm -hmm. something like that, but he wouldn't read a regular history book or anything, but he would read about sports figures and all, Willie Mays. I took him to Cincinnati one time. He's about six or seven, and we were down in the under the stadium going to the bathroom, and here come Willie. And I said, go up, and, go up and shake his hand, Fred. And he, that kid was paralyzed. He just stood there <laughs> with his mouth open. He couldn't move. Uh -huh. he, and after that, I said, why didn't you go on and shake your hand? I just got scared, Dad. I was <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 He's happy if he's going to the bowling alley with you or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he'd follow me all the time. And I keep these... ready of having him go with me so she could watch, he could watch me for her. <laughs> <laughs> but he liked to go keep score for the guy. The guy loved it because he didn't have to keep score. You didn't have to worry about it, right? Uh -huh. He'd keep score. And he wasn't but six, seven years old. He learned how to keep score at bowling out. Was he really good at math then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was a good student. Except when he got in that journalism class, he didn't go to class. He just did that. He didn't, he didn't want to go. He didn't need to go, giving those people his money. He didn't get to go on vacation. Of course, we said you have to stay home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like my mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Took that class over and didn't even need the class. Oh, <laughs> he's waste the money. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Fooling with his fraternity. Yeah. They always say take light, very light classes, maybe even classes that you know that won't harm your major. Because if not, you know, your GPA all, always goes down because mm -hmm. it's very stressful. Yeah. Yeah, the university ought to bring guys like him back more. Yeah, they should. Show these kids what they're doing now in the journalism because it's altogether different now. Mm -hmm. He sat right here in his house and came to see his mother in October and he was sitting right here doing his stories every day on the computer, mm -hmm. sending them back down there. And uh, they, it's amazing. Well, I told him, I don't want no job like that where they catch me anywhere I'm at. Mm -hmm. But they did that cell phone rang all the time and he was on that computer I said boy you don't ever get no time off you know i want somewhere where can't nobody find me once in a while <laughs> get your brain unscrambled but 
he loves it so much, you know, he would do it 24 hours a day. Yes. Take a vacation. Yeah. But he, he, you know, he'd get to go first class, and he said they serve you steaks in the press box and everything, you know, everything is first class, and he loves it, so he's not going to a golf tournament, he's going to spring baseball or mm -hmm. to a college game or a pro game or whatever it is, so he loves it. I don't know how his wife handled it because he ain't never home. They know traveling mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, some people, they just thrive on that. I wouldn't, I don't think I would do that. Mm. How else did you discipline your kids? You said that you, you know, you talked mm -hmm. to them about that class that they failed and well, I was with them whenever they needed it. <laughs> when they were little. We didn't have to. But we didn't have to mm -hmm. very much. Oh, you know, it'd just yeah. be, he wouldn't come home when he's supposed to. And mm -hmm. His mother would go down there to the park after him, and them guys say, Here come your mother, Fred. And he'd cut out running. <laughs> See, out running. It, would, it would be <laughs> supper time, and he hadn't, mm -hmm. hadn't even paid any attention. I said, Oh my goodness, boy. I'm to hang you. Highest truth. <laughs> talk about it. Hey, that coattail be flying. <laughs> you say, here come Miss Goodall. <laughs> yeah. What was the discipline like in the schools when they were in school? Do what now? What was the discipline like in the schools when you boys were in school? Oh, I don't think we have. We never had any real trouble with mm -hmm. really? our kids in school. Uh -uh, I don't. It's like when they got mad at each other you know, on yeah. ball team. Somebody say. Nobody blocking for them or passing yeah. the ball to them, that kind of stuff, which is normal. You know, it's going to happen with kids. But uh, I don't remember any real major problems mm -hmm. with them. I don't know. It's just but if the one thing, if the school officials know that you're interested in your children, they're going to let you know if there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. but they know you're going to be over there. Yeah. Anyway, so they're going to say, uh-uh, no, it's a good horse kid. You better get that straightened out because you don't, you're going to see his old man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they they wouldn't let anything happen. Like some kids, they just let them go and they say, well, your kid is bad. He won't cooperate. He won't do this and do that. And they don't uh, have that respect. But they were just with a really exceptionally good Group of kids. Kid. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. that yeah. was good. All those kids have gone on. And Vi and I were talking about well. that the other day. Yeah, and there was, you know, a couple of times I would have to get on the school officials because when they'd have the ball team, we would go to what they called the booster meetings, and they would have the kids get up and introduce their parents, you know. Our son get up and say, this is my dad, Hurley Goodall, my mother, Fred E. And sit down and get the little kid named Nate Johnson, there were several of them. My mother couldn't come, you know. Uh, I told her, I said, quit doing that. That's all you're doing is tearing that kid apart. Mm -hmm. You know, he can't help it if his mother won't come. Mm -hmm. You know, his father, you know, where he's at. And why do you embarrass the kid, mm -hmm. like, you know, making them do that? You know, it's not, so they quit doing that. And, uh, but, uh, other, you know, something like that, where they would just seem like they'd make those kids feel bad, you know, and sometimes kid wouldn't have any coat or anything. We'd give him one of our kids' coats, be cold, and he'd be over here all drawed up. Boy, where's your coat? I don't have none, Mr. Cutoff. Well, if Hurley got three or four coats, get one of them coats and take it and put it on, boy. Too cold to be walking around here without no coat. And they would, they would take it, you know, when you do it like that, not make them feel like, yeah. you know, they were We they stayed were at the down. Hay Adams hot, uh, Hotel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what they do. Right that's across from the White House. White House. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. I called my, call my conference and said, where's the best place to stay? <laughs> he said, well, the Hay Adams right across the street. You can walk there, Hurl. I said, that's where I want to stay. Mm -hmm. So we stayed but, there. But I knew once I parked my car, I didn't want to be getting it out, not in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky because that was in December and the weather was nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could, had to have a jacket, but mm -hmm. the sun was shining and it was pretty nice weather.
Hmm. What kind of relationship did you guys have with your boys' teachers? We had a pretty good relationship mm -hmm. with the teacher and the principal, too, because mm -hmm. we always participated in PTA, and mm -hmm. they had a, when they started junior high school, it was a new junior high school that they built about a mile north of here. And it, at first, it was the first time they had mixed some of the white kids that they on over mm -hmm. that way with black kids. And they had some, the white kids would go to school on the bus, and they would come by and the windows would be down, they'd be calling black kids names, you know, mm -hmm. and all that. So we formed what was called a committee of 14, 14 parents. And of course, we were right in there with the 14. <laughs> and 14. We, worked, we worked our way through it. And got through that, and uh, got that sidewalk bill. Yeah, yeah. So that Centennial Clear the Black all kids the way didn't down. have to walk in the street because there wasn't any sidewalk. So we made them build a sidewalk about a mile long from the Centennial over here, clear up to Magalia Road, mm -hmm. so those kids didn't have to walk in the street, dodge those buses and all. But yeah, we, we had, had a good relationship with. So they knew we were interested in our uh -huh. kids, and we were going to be there. And I was going to say it was, it was. The, and we were interested in all the kids. All we wanted was, you know, the school to be a mm -hmm. good school mm -hmm. for all of them. And uh, very boy. few of them didn't go on to college. Because mm -hmm. I know it was at least 14 that we took down there to IU for the groups program. And then there were several that went to Purdue under the other program, and some went to Ball State. But they were an exceptional group of kids because none of them ever got in any trouble, you know, uh, drinking or mm -hmm. fighting or anything like that, you know. I don't remember any of those kids ever getting in that kind of trouble. You know, we see them all the time now. They, they tell us how much they appreciate it, you know, how we flew with them. Mm -hmm. I was coaching the team. I, tell people if I'd got hit, I had pick up truck and be 15 of them little suckers on the back, <laughs> take them to the ball game. If I'd got hit, I'd still be under the jail, be in the suit. Mm -hmm. You know, you hang it off the head and act silly, and I'm driving on like I don't have good sense. <laughs> Even though I ought to be worried about it until after I thought about it, reflected on it. I said, mm -hmm. well, I'm glad to them kids who didn't get hit by a train or something. That was the, the biggest thing that I saw is that as a parent, if you got out there and you worked with the kids and helped them, the other parent would let you do it all. They wouldn't do nothing. Mm -hmm. you know, they felt like, well, Mr. Goodall's coming, mm -hmm. he'll get you. So sure. I don't have to worry about taking it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they did come and say, Goodall, you can take them, I'll take them, son. Mm -hmm. That didn't have they'd let you keep on doing it. Yeah, they just didn't see. Well, if he's doing it, why should I get up out of my chair and put they my didn't beer even back? Worry in about the it. We went a yeah. whole football season. So we were going to have a banquet at the end of that time, you know. At, and this one old boy didn't, you know, he didn't bring his note back whether he'd be there or anything. Mm -hmm. right? Nobody called. So we went by their house, the home, mm -hmm. so we could in personally invite those people. And that lady said, football? I knew he was doing something. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the season, the season. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I mm -hmm. said, well, he, I said, whatever his name was, I said, he played, he played, he was there. And Oh my goodness, so that's, that's what you... Yes, I knew he doing something, but I didn't know he was playing that play football. football. Wow. <laughs> Whole season, kid going to practice and everything. She didn't know where he was going. Mm -hmm. That's what she said. You didn't bother to ask. Mm -mm. Probably didn't even know what football was. The way she was talking, that. No wonder this is not taken. Is it not working enough? Say something, Mr. Goodall. Yeah, it's working. I see that needle move. <laughs>
I'm sitting here like the whole time. No, it's been moving, but yeah, it's moving. now it's moving right. Cause I'm sitting like, okay, this is not moving right. Something's not right. Yeah, it's moving. Hey, Mavoy, okay. I'm gonna get this one. Okay, so we're gonna do 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 this one. Okay, so they got any black history or black culture or black literature in their classes? I think they got some, mm -hmm. but you know, I felt it was important for us in our church to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they did pretty pretty much do that. So uh, we, uh, I don't feel like they missed too much. The only thing I ever was sorry about mm -hmm. is that I had in my mind when the first March on Washington took place take off from work and go, and I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I always regretted that, or they would have been there, because I would usually attend things like that and mm -hmm. take the kids with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were in Montgomery when the bus boycott was going on, mm -hmm. and our kids was with us, and uh, we, we would take, we'd stop, pick up people. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. yeah, they would stand on the corner and they'd give you the victory sign, you know, that mm -hmm. meant they needed a ride. You stop, pick them up, and tell them where you're going, and every time an empty bus would come by, and people would cheer. Mm -hmm. And that's when we first met Dr. King and his wife at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church down there, and that was before he became famous. He was mm -hmm. a minister there, and I was always awed by Montgomery, Alabama, even though the segregation and all was so apparent, but that that church is right downtown Montgomery and you can look out the front door of that church and look right at the front door of the state capitol in Montgomery, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And there were black restaurants in downtown Montgomery. And, you know, with all the, with all the other stuff, there was still, here's this black church right there. You almost throw a stone from the state house to that church where he was a minister. There's so many contradictions mm -hmm. there at, in uh, Montgomery. But also that the black community there had generated a, an economy and, a, I guess, customs of their own. And we went to the Black Elks Club there for dances and all that. And that Black Elks Club in Montgomery, Alabama was nicer than the White Elks Club here in Muncie, Indiana. And I always, you know, uh, felt that as long as you stayed within the bounds of the black community there in, in Montgomery, you were really better off than you was here in Muncie, Indiana. Mm -hmm. But when you went outside of that neighborhood, you didn't know what was going, what was going to happen to you. You know, uh, I had a few instances. One time I had a flat tire down there. And, you know, this is back in the 50s now. You can get a flat tire chain for about three bucks in. And stop in the filling station. The guy fixed my tire and everything. And he got through. I gave him a 20. He said, that's just right. I said, okay. I got in my car and drove away. Mm -hmm. I'm going to argue with him. Mm -hmm. If I'd been here, I said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Go down there. I said, let him have the yeah. point. It ain't worth arguing about. Yeah. Well, you know, you had your family with you and your kids and all, so you just let it go. I was going to keep the change. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even throw it back at him. Like, no, I'll keep the change. But there, you know, there were real contradictions there, but I always enjoyed going and uh, they, we, they, they had a lot of restaurants and I guess speakeasies or whatever you call it, you know, and you could go and you go through the front, there'd be a barber shop and maybe a little restaurant cafe and then you go on through and out in the back would be tables and chairs and all and there'd be a blues band out there mm. getting down at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning mm -hmm. <laughs> and you could sit out there and dig them blues. <laughs> all day. <laughs> yeah, 
I never forget, we were out there one time. So there was a guy named Clarence Carter, the old 4th of July weekend. <laughs> I got to sit out there listening to blues. It was 6 o'clock in the evening before I left that place. I was from 10 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the evening. They were playing the blues. And watching those and people dance. Yeah, the, really. the night they had lights all up in the trees. They like were the fighting or anything. I just went there. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but y'all yeah, and people, they were out there, they partying all day. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> they did. You know I mean? It was a whole different culture uh-huh. than it was around here, but I enjoyed it. But they didn't do a lot of fighting. There wasn't fighting. a lot of fighting. No, and that's all that what kind I was saying. Mm-hmm. Fight. Ooh, I, I'm not going if the, if the fight in there. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Butch said. He said, look to them, so they pick those people who want to fight. He said, I ain't going there. Mm-hmm. They learned that from me. I wasn't going nowhere like that. Yeah. But they didn't do that. You know, like I say, they had a culture within a culture. They knew they had businesses that they ran, just like mm-hmm. majority mm-hmm. community runs. And Real nice you restaurants. Saw black people, bricklayers, mm-hmm. cement finishers, plasters, electricians, doing everything. You know, it wasn't like here where the trade unions pretty much grows out black guys. Mm-hmm. So very few blacks in skill jobs around here because the unions kept them out. But you would go south and you would see a whole subdivision being built and mostly all black skill workers doing the work. Mm-hmm. So like I say, there were a lot of contradictions in the in the south, mm-hmm. that uh, wasn't apparent unless you looked for them, and I was always looking for the difference because I was curious because I had never been south before I met her. Mm. What kind of things did you do to fill in the gaps with your with your voice, like with the the black history, like the to to like the well, you know, there. any anything I get my hands on, you know, uh, Ebony Magazine used to put out black insights, set encyclopedias and all. And that mm-hmm. was always in our home, you know, those kind of books, anything that I could buy and purchase like that. And always had Jet Magazine and Ebony and the black magazines, you know, in our home. And uh, any time we could go see someone, you know, like, I don't know, Jesse Owens come here and raced a horse down there in McCullough Park or something, I'd take my kids to anything like that, mm-hmm. you know. And, uh, yeah, we take them all the time, everywhere. Mm-hmm. We go to the zoo, taking Cincinnati to the zoo and, and Indianapolis, yeah. a whole bunch of stuff, you know. Oh yeah, they went wherever we went, yeah. you know, and uh, I remember Cleod was two years old when old. Old. we went to Harlem that time. Took mm-hmm. up in Harlem, and we stayed up there at the, was that hotel up there? At <laughs> Teresa. Teresa Hotel, Teresa, and and Fidel Castro had just been there killing them chickens in that hotel, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. But we just, you know, go out there and walk down, walk on the streets of Harlem with the Apollo Theater and all that stuff, and nobody messed with us, and. Uh, we stayed up there three or four days, and we would take them with us where we would go. Mm-hmm. And so I, my mother went with me, and she stayed with the kid, and Freddie and I would go out to a nightclub or something while we were there. But I always had a good time. She, we'd go to Birdland and places, and people treat you nice. I never will forget that, because mm-hmm. we went there, that place was crowded. You know, and people wouldn't believe that would happen in New York City. But we were standing back there, and some guy come back and said, Hey, fella, you want a seat? I said, Yeah. He said, Well, follow me. Me and my girlfriend are getting ready to leave, and you can have our seat. Huh. And I followed him, and when he got down there, he waved to her to come out. And we went in, <laughs> sat down in them seats. I couldn't believe it. Here I'm in New York City. <laughs> and somebody did that, you know, but they did. So we've had all kind of really haven't had any real bad experiences mm-hmm. in any place like that. Uh, I don't know where we looked like we were lost and they felt sorry for mm-hmm. us about what it was, but he, he did that and uh, I never did forget it. We didn't think we were going to stay 
day because you said I'm Yeah, I'm not going to stand back here for the whole show. Wait the next show start. You know, and I think it was Big Joe Turner was mm -hmm. up there that night. That place was packed. We don't want to ever get a seat. Mm -hmm. He did so follow me and when I the old lady get up, you slip on in there. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Yeah. How do you feel about education being so important to people, but then well, since a lot of kids go off to college, they leave the community, and then they don't come back? Mm -hmm. How do you... Well, that's one of the most frustrating things mm -hmm. about it all. You know, mm -hmm. you work hard to educate your kids, and then some other community benefits from that education. Mm -hmm. The kid and the ones that stay are the ones that are the potheads and Doing the ones that aren't doing anything and the problem mm -hmm. the kids are the ones that stay but you know that's just the nature of the animal and I don't know you know what we can do about it hopefully that our community and the business community and other people would begin to open up and do some things to encourage those kids to, to stay here in mm -hmm. fact I've talked to the superintendent of schools just recently and ask them to consider a grow our own program for teachers. I mm -hmm. said that we identify some of these kids that have grown up here are in the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, wherever the ideal time is to get them and say, if you'll take the proper classes and keep your grades up and all, we'll see that you get a scholarship to Ball State University. And if you go through the hoops and get the grade there'll be a job waiting for you mm -hmm. when you graduate i said because they're already here they grew up here mm -hmm. nine to nine, ten their family is here so they don't have any trepidation about it. staying here mm -hmm. it's just if they they go where the employment opportunity is and we can grow our own and so in the process now of negotiating with the community foundation to mm -hmm. fund it and ball state to participate and for the monthly schools to work on it so yeah that would be cool you think that'll yeah. come through you think that'll that'll yeah all work it'll out? happen yeah good it's a long long right. range process mm -hmm. yeah. but too just in this project here you know something happened that was unexpected for me i don't know if y'all remember the days when eric asked if anybody would stay in months if they had a job here mm -hmm. And five, I think five kids held up their hand. Two of them were black. I wasn't one of them. But I, I went out and told the superintendent of schools. They keep telling me they can't find them. And I said, we had two black students that held up their hand. One was male and one was female. And if they're interested, I want to know if you guys will interview them. And he said, yeah, we'd be glad to, really. So I talked to Jared. And Jared said, yeah, I'd be willing to go, Earl. So I took him out there about a week ago and interviewed him. Mm -hmm. I hope it works out. I don't know. <laughs> but, That'd be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, That's I, really guys, you know, I think they ought to be working with the Black Student Association mm -hmm. more than that. Go out and say, you know, how many of you would be willing to stay here if you had a job? And, you know, we'll give you an interview mm -hmm. instead of assuming that they don't yeah. want to stay. Yeah, cause that's and that's the majority of the time what people do is that like you see they go to where the mm -hmm. the jobs are. Yeah. Yeah. The majority of the time they think the jobs are back in Indianapolis and things like that, and then they get mm -hmm. home and they're not available, and then they start doing other things, and they end mm -hmm. up going back to the schools by like substitute teaching and things like that. Mm -hmm. Cause I find a lot of my friends once they graduate, I've had like four friends graduate. And three of them are now substitute teachers, and that mm -hmm. that wasn't even the area. And it's like it's it's funny how you know you went back to the school system, and that wasn't your area. So I don't know. My home is Indianapolis, yeah. so most is like mm, kind of I don't know. I know I have I will go back. To, and if that if that was offered in Indianapolis, then yeah, I probably would take it. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Why. Um, well, I don't think the schools do a very aggressive job of recruiting black teachers I, I think if they happen to fall on the one or something they'll look at them and all but they, they don't really have a commitment I always tell them well when you need a basketball coach or something you know how to go out and find yeah, it you can go out and find 
recruit after the American teachers, through. you know, and it's, it's to their their benefit in the long run because, like I say, the kids need the role models, and the schools need people in there to keep some balance in the mm -hmm. thing. Because my experience in life has been that just a black person sitting in the room or with the group makes them whites act all together different. Mm -hmm. You know, I in politics. If we get into that Democratic caucus down there in Indianapolis and there are five or six black legislators in there, I guarantee there won't be no racist words said or used in there when mm -hmm. we're sitting in there. And that just changes that whole mm -hmm. mode of behavior. And it's important to have that presence there because I know some of those people, you know, they don't care. You know, when I went on the fire department, there was a lot of resistance, you know. We don't want to work with blacks. We don't want to sleep in a bed that a black person slept in. We don't want to eat out of a pan that a black person cooked in. We don't want to sit on a toilet stool that a black person doesn't sit on. All that crazy stuff, you know. And they, when they go out to theater or somewhere, they don't know who sat on the toilet before they got there, you know. But they come up with all that crap, you know. So I, I just think it's important for that presence, you know, to be there yeah. in all aspects, and it changes behavior altogether. The same language and code words are not used when someone is sitting there. And if they want the institution to be successful and be diverse, as they claim they do, they would want it to be that way, too. It makes it easier and better for everybody mm -hmm. in that final analysis. But we haven't got to that place, unfortunately, as a country. And in some places, it's worse than others. We still got a long way to go mm -hmm. as a nation near a race relation. And uh, I know whites get tired of hearing black people complain, bitch about it all the time. But all they got to if they could walk in our shoes for <laughs> just a little while, they would begin to understand. So. That's uh, that's the way I feel. Mm -hmm. But things are better. I mean, I do, I have to say that they're much better than they were when I grew up. But we still got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Julius mentioned the program that Southside and Ball State are going to start working together to get uh, some of the education majors into the schools there to get some real experiences other than just like working with Burris. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that'll that help at all? To, I think anything to that, that exposes them to, you know, people other kind of, you know, the thing that's bothering me as much as anything with our school system is the fact that so many people that are teaching our children don't live in the community with the children. Mm -hmm. They just come here and make their money and go back to Hartford City. Uh, Winchester, or somewhere where not a black person, nowhere around. And, you know, they not only don't care about our kids, they don't care about the white kids in Muncie. Mm -hmm. Don't care about them. It's just a place for them to come make their money. And then go back to their white suburb and get in their cocoon and turn off on people. And, I wouldn't live in Muncie. I wouldn't do this in Muncie. But every time they get sick, they go over here at Ball Hospital. Mm -hmm. They want to go to college, they go over here at Ball State University. They want to teach, they're over here teaching in the monthly school system. Half of the police department, half of the fire department. Members don't even live in the city and pay taxes, support their own jobs. And to me, that's wrong. I mean, if you won't take money out of the place, put something back into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but that's the way our society is, and we've structured it and set it up that way. And it's creating a whole lot of problems that people don't want to deal with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think if you're going if you're going to teach somewhere, live where you teach, send your kids to the same school you're teaching in. And if you don't think it's good enough for your kids, it's not good enough for mine. I went to Washington Carver's Family Literacy Night a couple weeks ago, and um, a couple of the teachers they had um, kind of a session where. I guess standardized testing is coming up, and so they were asking parents, what are you going to do to help your kids get ready for standardized testing? And a couple of the teachers brought up 
Well now, my daughter goes to Yorktown, and so they're going to be going through this testing too, and this is what I'm going to do with my daughter, mm. and I, yeah, I really, mm -hmm. that really struck me. My daughter goes to Yorktown. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I say, they, they don't even have a positive attitude about our community, and you transmit that to those young people, whether you realize it or not, mm -hmm. you know, like, I'm over here teaching, but I wouldn't live here. Well, if you wouldn't live here, it must be something wrong with it. What's wrong with it? I've got to live here in a place that's something wrong with it. I mean, you send that message. And, you know, years ago, it, there were always a few like that, but now it seems like that's where the majority of people that are in education live out in the suburbs. They don't live in the city mm -hmm. and interact with the kids in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm... I'm almost inclined to go for some residency rules. You don't live where you work, keep on moving. Go back where you live and get a job. That's not going to happen, but there are people that are talking about it. I think uh, Gary, Indiana, there was a piece of legislation in the hopper that I read the other day that if they get a job, teach them Gary schools, they have to stay in the city for at least five years before they can move out. I don't think it'll pass. I don't think it'll pass because mm -hmm. the majority of legislators won't vote for it. Indiana does that. I have a scholarship with yeah. in an office where I have to go to an international school and teach for two years because I got a scholarship from them. Well, that's probably a little different. This is just a broad brush, you know, that if you teach in there, in an after school system, you got to live. If you, if you, if oh, you yeah, move out yeah, before yeah. you've been there five years, they can fire you. Mm. Mm, okay. you know, but I think it's somebody trying to send some people a message more than being serious about getting the law passed. Sometimes you have to do things to bring things to people's attention to get them to begin to think about what they're doing, what their policies are doing. Mm -hmm. And it really gripes me when policemen and firefighters are sitting up raising hell for more money to raise the people's taxes in the city that they work for, but they won't live in the city and pay those taxes. Mm -hmm. That really gripes me. And I know as well as I'm sitting here that they ain't gonna hire no black marshal for Yorktown that lives in Muncie, but they don't see nothing wrong with Muncie police officers living in Yorktown. But they ain't reverse it. They ain't gonna do it. Well, he don't live here. He don't know us. He don't know mm -hmm. about us. They don't see nothing wrong with the reverse. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody else, but still not right. The, the double standard is not right. Mm -hmm. You have any more? Are you going to pass it? I'm looking <laughs> forward to see what you guys are going to come up with. How you're going to attack this monster. And how it's all going to hang together when you get through. I'm sure Eric has some ideas that guide you in the mm -hmm. right direction where it all comes to fruition. I don't think he's got a final picture, but I'm sure he has something in mind mm -hmm. what he wants to look like. We have our outlines, so we have our outlines due tomorrow. Yeah, we're all gonna, the groups are all going to share outlines with mm -hmm. each other. Okay. Uh, and we're going to Q, Q and Q to eat. Mm -hmm. gonna, he's mm -hmm. going to have a five course meal while <laughs> there. And um, share our outlines and make sure they're kind of, we're you know, the where they are, or... right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's going to be down net cracking time for too long. Yep. You got that deadline, that's going to make you do something, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So it's good in some ways to have that kind of deadline, but as long as it doesn't crowd you yeah. too much. But it, it takes you a little while to really figure out what you want to do and where you want to go and, and what they're really looking for mm -hmm. and how it all ties together. Mm -hmm. It's not like seven or eight different communities you talk about. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to it. I've been impressed with the quality of the students. 
the tenacity that you guys have. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's good. Yeah. Cream of the crop. <laughs> I don't know about that. We like to think so. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I say that all the uh, time, though. Yeah. Yeah. Me, I yeah. know. Well, it's yeah, interesting yeah. Just, yeah, to, well, okay. just to sit and listen to you guys talk. Mm -hmm. We get to talk to each other. Y'all don't realize what you're saying or how you're saying it, but it's it's interesting to mm -hmm. just hear you express yourselves yeah. about it. I think you kind of sent you and kind of unique project and but I told some of them I with the advantage that you guys have is that you will live long enough to see the fruits of your labor. Most of the survivors won't because it'll be 25, 30 years down the road. When them Lynn's wrote that middle town in 1929, they had no idea it would become a classic. Mm -hmm. and required reading for a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. Did you read the article in Sunday's paper? Mm -hmm. The article. Here's a lady that lived here mm -hmm. a long time ago and this lady stopped me out in the mall about two months, three months ago and said there's a story about a lady that lived out here in Selma, Indiana. And they, owned, they had a farm, they didn't own a farm, they were sharecroppers, a black lady. And uh, we thought a lot of that family. And, wow. and I said, how could a woman like that? And, and so then I found one of the nephews that she raised out there and I called him in Indianapolis. And he said that that lady had graduated from medical college with a nursing degree and that she had fallen in love with Paul Lawrence Dunbar poet from Dayton, Ohio, black poet, mm -hmm. and they had become disillusioned with racism in the United States, so they'd gone to Europe, and they ended up in Germany, and she had become so fluent in, Germ in the German language that the German gov government hired her as an interpreter hmm. to the United States wow. for the government of Germany, and then they they got mixed up with Frederick Douglass some kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so they were, Dunbar was with Frederick Douglass when they went to the Chicago Exposition in 1898, mm -hmm. I think it was, and all that went on and all that happened and everything. And so I got into it, I said, how did that woman come to Muntz, Indiana? Somebody like that. Come find out. Her father was the minister of my church. So our father and mother lived here in Muncie. And when they broke up, she come here. After she broke up with Paul Dunbar. Mm -hmm. And she met this Mr. Haywood was on this farm out here and they married and she stayed here. And they she helped start the first black YWCA for girl, young black girls in this city. Mm -hmm. And part of one of part of the story in the paper is that one of the ball ladies was give donating them ten thousand dollars for that YWCA and that's a lot of money back mm -hmm. there in nineteen twenties. Mm -hmm. And evidently when she was giving her the check, she said something that made Mrs. Haywood angry and said she tore up the ten thousand dollar check. She wouldn't take it. She said, but they made up later on and they got the money and all so that was mm -hmm. an innocent didn't say what, <laughs> what she got angry with, what she said that made her angry. Did anybody tear up a $10,000 check okay. back in, in the 1920s? <laughs> yeah, you're right. They, they really were mad at more than the money. But it, it was just that story just kept unfolding and then come find out this nephew and a reporter from Muncie Star went over and visited with him. He was a Tuskegee Airman. And so that that story just kept, really? and I went up to the newspaper and told him about it, and I asked for a certain writer, because I know he was a good writer, to do the story, and they did an excellent job, and put on the front page of the Muncie mm -hmm. paper, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I just wrote a letter to the editor and told him, most time I see a black face on the front of the Muncie paper, somebody committed a crime. Mm -hmm. Thanks for putting something positive on there. Mm -hmm. So... 
Well, I guess. It was interesting that that lady how that I just couldn't figure out how somebody like that would come and stay in Muncie, but she did. Really cool and, story. Yeah, and all those kids graduated. Her sister died, and I think there were four kids, and all of them went on college, graduated from college. Mm -hmm. uh, your mention in church reminded me of one last question. Okay. Before this is my last one. Um, how did you go about training your kids religiously? You just started taking them to Sunday school, mm -hmm. and uh, they pretty much, you know, develop their own taste. I don't I don't think either one of them even go to church regularly now. If they mm -hmm. do, I never have seen any indication of it. I think they belong to church. Yeah, they go, but not... But they're not... Real active. Mm -mm. No, they're not as, I guess, loyal as we are. And it's kind mm -hmm. of a part of our life, you know, it's, yeah. Go to church on Sunday morning. I get mad at the preacher half the time. <laughs> but he's always doing something he don't have no business doing. But, you know, that happened. Preachers come and go. Mm -hmm. You know, I stay there for the church, not mm -hmm. for the preacher. Some people, they worship the minister. I don't worship no minister. They're human just like I am. Mm -hmm. They have faults and fallacies. And so I don't put them on a pedestal. You know, they just... Uh, Another man with a job to do like me, and if he don't do right, I tell him about it. And basically, all I want is somebody to be honest with people and mm -hmm. be up front and don't be up there putting people down because he has a podium that no one can respond to. And I got a little upset with him when kids were out here last two weeks ago on Sunday. Uh -huh. sure. And he made some comments that I thought were inappropriate but it's not about Jewish people which mm -hmm. I didn't like he didn't have to say that you know? and I'd never heard him say anything like that so I don't know what made him motivate him to. <laughs> but I mean he didn't know whether some of the students were Jewish or not I didn't either but I thought it was inappropriate for him to Mm -hmm. say it, yeah. you know, that they thought they were a chosen people, but just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you're saved and a whole bunch of crap that had nothing to do with the mm -hmm. price apples. <laughs> but he'd been known to stick his foot in his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Do you guys do devotions at home too? Yeah, we do devotions. Very at seldom, mm -hmm. you know. Well, you know, if we'd like last night, BET had this big gospel program mm -hmm. for three hours, and we sat up here and watched it. I saw that. Yeah. I saw we, a few minutes. Yeah, of it. something like that. But you know, I'm not a. Just watched a few minutes. I'm not a religious. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I was going to. Speak. I'm not a religious fanatic, uh -huh. but you know, I I feel that there there are mm -hmm. you know powers in the universe that are greater than we are, and I guess I basically I believe in a supreme being, but I don't see it manifested through men too much, or women, mm -hmm. most of the time. But uh, I think there has to be some kind of moral compass, you know, or else we're all just like crabs in a barrel, pulling one back in when it tries to get out, you know. If you don't have some kind of moral compass, but I don't worship no preachers. Mm -hmm. There's men like me with a job to do, and if they do it well, I respect them. If they do it bad, I don't respect them, and there's a lot more bad ones than there are good ones, in my experience, mm -hmm. because they eventually they just become money grabbers, you know, just, and they just keep beating up on these old people, telling them they ought to be tied and they ought to be given more and all that. And some of these little old women just barely, mm -hmm. barely making it, you know, have enough to eat and all that stuff. And a lot of times they can't afford to give 10% of their income to the mm -hmm. church. And I don't think they ought to be hounding them like that. You gotta do what you can. Yeah. You can't do any more than that. Yeah. And if that's not good enough, well, then 
You just have to go out and get you some more members. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, don't be pounding and hounding those old people to death that's trying to live off a Social Security check that they just can't afford to to give out. You know, they can give a dollar or two a week. That's all they can afford to give. Mm -hmm. So don't be hounding them, mm -hmm. pounding on them. Make them feeling guilty when you're going to hell if you don't tithe and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. I just think that's terrible, you know, whipping on people's minds like that. And a lot of them are lonely and sick and they're weak and they're vulnerable. And uh, I just don't. That's the part about the church that I don't like. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I believe that the church has really been an important. It's been an important part of my life because that's basically where I learned to get up and speak before a group. The first group I ever got and give my little thing at Christmas time. You know. Testimony. Yeah. Well, not testimony, but a little poem that you say at mm -hmm. Christmas time. You know, sleigh bells ringing or something. And all that, you know, about we get to giggling and laughing each other and all. Oh, Calm down, son. You'll be all right. You know, don't let it get to you. <laughs> and they, so, you know, and, and they were they were sincere. You know, they really wanted us to do well and to succeed in life. And I'm sure that, in fact, they're doing the depression. When I was a little kid, if it wasn't for them churches, a whole lot of them people would have actually been hungry. They could always go to church and get a meal when they couldn't get a Bill anywhere else. So the churches serve some good purposes, particularly in the black community. And it was a place for them to get together where they could feel free to express themselves and not feel threatened by all of the forces mm -hmm. that are out there oppressing on them. And it really gave them the strength to get through a lot of crappy stuff in this country in its early years. And uh, so I give it a lot of credit, but also there's a, a lot of preachers out there that are agents of the devil, I think. And they don't particularly mean well for anybody, you know. And I see them exploit some of those weak people too much, and I don't like that. Mm -hmm. So, you have to take the bitter with the sweet. Hope that more sweet comes out than bitter. I was thinking about coming to church at Schaefer Chapel this Sunday because I had to be at home when all the rest of the kids went. Okay, well, I hope it don't snow no more. <laughs> 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 we won't be able to go last Sunday and no one went because no. I was up there with uh, Jamie yesterday mm -hmm. and I had to clean the steps off so we could get into church. So that's the guys doing the video. Pastor, why not that daughter? How old is the old pastor? He's not old as I am. He, but he lives, lives in, in Richmond. Richmond. He ain't even over here. Mm. He comes over here every Sunday to preach and harangue you about money. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes back to Richmond. <laughs> so if the snow's on the step, it's going to be there when he comes back the next Sunday. Mm. <laughs> it's up to him to get it all. But, you know, I, I can deal with that. That's all right. I can deal with that. But it's just some of the ways they do business and all I don't agree with. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't let nobody take my money. And then when I ask them what they did with it, they tell me ain't none of my business. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't dig that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's, you know how that is. That's one of the weaknesses we as a people have. Every group I've been in seems like money gets them in trouble for right. so mm -hmm. They cannot handle the money, keep records and all that. Either they don't want to or they can't. Mm -hmm. But almost even veterans groups I've been associated with and social clubs and businesses and everything else, you know, they get funny with the money, and that's when it breaks up. And it's just so easy 
to do the right thing and keep the record and say, here's what came in and here's what went out and here's what it went for. And that that's not that hard. But it's hard for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And the more money that comes, the harder it is to keep it straight. So. Mm -hmm. I think I'm out of questions. <laughs> Is there anything okay. we've forgotten to ask you? Anything that you? No, think I can't think important? of anything. Uh, no, not not really. Uh, I I can't think of anything. And you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't gonna say anything. <laughs> well, you tell me after you leave. To... <laughs> <laughs> You shouldn't have said so and so and so and so. No, I won't. <laughs> no, I won't. I'm so worried about this thing. No, it's working. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it just normally it just moves like over here a lot, and I'm saying it's just kind of low. So you see that needle waving, so you know it's recording. Yeah. Usually picks up pretty well, even yeah. when it doesn't yeah. very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounded like it had her voice pretty well. <laughs> yeah, turn up the volume in here. Just close it. I hope it's mine. Well, hope we answered the questions as well as we could. Yeah, thanks for talking to us.